Uh, good afternoon, and thank you everyone for joining today's Norms and Behavioral Change talk. Uh, my name is Samira Sayed, and I'm the Managing Director of the Center for Social Norms and Behavioral Dynamics here at the University of Pennsylvania. We have quite an interesting Novak talk for you today, uh, in which we will start with a brief talk by an early career researcher, Kwaku Doana Tian Adu, who earned his PhD at the University of Missouri, and this will be followed by the main talk by Professor Alexander Kaplan from the Norwegian School of Economics. Uh, after these talks, we'll have a Q&A segment open to all participants towards the end of today's session. Uh, for those of you who might be new to this series, the NOBEC talks are organized by the Center for Social Norms and Behavioral Dynamics here at Penn with the support of the Philosophy, Politics, and Economics program and in partnership with the Masters of Behavioral and Decision Sciences program. The center itself is a research center which provides specialized consulting, research, and training services to organizations throughout the world seeking to enact positive behavioral change. And now here you can see the schedule of Novak talks that we have lined up uh, through 2024. We have a full schedule and you can visit our website to register for, the, for these future talks. And something that I can kind of give a spoiler alert for is that in October of next year, we don't have a talk because we are in the, in the process of planning for a Novak conference in October of next year, um, which we plan on having on the theme of polarization and democratic norms. So just a heads up to everyone on that. And also aside from that, um, one last side note for our talks in 2024, uh, we, will, we very much welcome interest from and suggestions for early career researchers. So either current or recently graduated PhD candidates and also current or recent postdocs who may be interested in offering brief you know, five minute presentations during our talks in 2024. I believe we have another five slots open for this. So uh, just later on, I'll put my, uh, my email address in the chat. So you're very welcome to reach out to me on that. Um, lastly, before we go ahead and turn to our speakers, we just have a couple of, a couple of ground rules. Um, you should automatically be muted, but if not, we kindly ask you to mute yourself. Um, if possible, please keep your camera on so we can have a more interactive conversation today. And for questions, please use the chat at any time or raise your hand as we'll have a Q&A segment at the end of today's session. And last but not least, the recordings of these sessions, these Novak talks, will be uploaded to our website and on YouTube as well. And so with that, I will uh, turn to our first presenter, uh, who is an early career researcher, Kwaku Danatian Adu, and he goes by Adu. So I'll continue with that. Um, Adu received his PhD in political science from the University of Missouri and is currently a research manager at NQO Research in Nova Scotia, Canada. He was an African fellow at the World Bank Group in Washington, DC before his current role. His research looks specifically at the origins of corruption and accountability and why some countries, subnational entities and individuals are more corrupt than others. So at this time, I'll just stop sharing my screen so that Adu, you can go ahead and present. And as you do that, I'll share with folks that Adu's presentation today is on the following, corruption and inequality, experimental evidence from Cote d'Ivoire. So with that, Adu, I hand it over to you and thank you so much for joining us. Perfect. Um, thank you very much. Uh, let me put full screen here. Yep. There we go. All right. Yeah, thank you so much. And um, so it is a five minute talk, so I will go fast. And this is a new project I'm working on. And basically, um, corruption and inequality and identity are really key variables in explaining development in Africa. And you have a few studies trying to um, really understand how corruption uh, impacts inequality. And in the case of Africa, you have actually very few studies that do that. And when they do, they ignore the um, role of identity in this relationship. And which, again, in the case of Africa is a very big variable given how um, ethnically varied uh, the continent is. So, um, and when you see identity being analyzed, especially um, ethnicity is analyzed as a determinant of corruption. And we can see that is one of the main variables that we use to explain corruption. But I also think that it is actually a consequence of corruption. And, uh, 
this new study basically is investigating the effect of corruption on inequality. And I focus on Cote d'Ivoire. And um, my main argument here is that um, ethnicity will kind of reinforce the relationship between uh, corruption and inequality. And to test that idea, I first had a probability survey. And what I find actually there is a strong relationship between uh, corruption and inequality. But I also move further and try and write and run an experiment. Uh, so Cote is hosting the African Cup Foundations and there have been a big scandal of um, money being embezzled by um, some officials. And that was a few months ago. So I use that as a prompt and see how people react to that and also test the ethnicity um, argument. So in the experiment, I find that there is a relationship between um, corruption and inequality. However, moving further, it shows that um, those who are prompted with the corruption uh, event will tend to say they identify more as an, part of an ethnic group than nationally. So people tend to be more drawn to the ethnicity instead of being Ivorian simply in, this, in, in the case of this study. So which is, uh, I think has very deep implication for development because we know that um, corruption is a big issue in Africa and we have mostly, we're looking at the consequences, we don't realize that uh, it may actually have a feedback uh, loop here. So I would be glad to discuss this further uh, if we, we have time at the end. But yes, so uh, this is the main idea I wanted to present today. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Adieu. And, uh, and and thank you for sharing your contact information as well. What we'll share with everyone is that if you have any questions for Adieu, please feel free to put them in the chat. Um, and if they come in the meantime, then uh, we can take it towards the, towards the end of today's session when we have the Q&A segment. Um, and so with that, we will go ahead and move to today's main talk. Um, I'll just share my screen once again. So, so we'll move with that to today's main talk, which will be by Professor Alexander Kaplan. Uh, Dr. Kaplan is a professor at the Department of Economics within the Norwegian School of Economics, where his academic positions include Deputy Director of the Center of Excellence, FAIR FAIR, or the Center for Experimental Research on Fairness, Inequality, and Rationality. He's the co-director of the research group, um, the Choice Lab, and chairman of the Center of Ethics and Economics. Um, and with that, Alexander, I'll just stop sharing my screen so you can share as well. And while you do that, I'll share with folks that Alexander's research interests are behavioral, experimental, and public economics, business ethics, social choice theory, political philosophy, and distributive justice. His talk today is on fairness across the world. And with that, I'll hand it over to you, Alexander. And thank you again so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's, I, I have to say, I really love the, 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 these talks and the whole setup. So I'm super happy to be invited and uh, to take part in it. So uh, the title of my talk, as you said, it's um, fairness across the world. It's a uh, joint work with uh, some of my uh, long-time co-authors, Ingrid Almos, Eric Sorensen, and Bertil Pongaden. And I'll jump straight, since it's only a 45 minutes talk, to the backdrop of, um, of this project. So the backdrop is the enormous differences that we have the differences in differences, so to speak, across the world. So the map I'm showing you here is, is, is a map of the Gini coefficient in different countries. So actually, the Gini coefficient in the countries that are going to be that's part of this uh, study. And as you all know, and, uh, uh, there are enormous differences in inequality across the world. So you have some countries like South uh, Africa, for example, with a Gini coefficient of 0.65. Uh, and you have countries like the country where I'm coming from, um, Norway, where the Gini coefficient in disposable income is close to 0.25. There are obviously 
tons of reasons why why they have these differences. These are very different countries, uh, both in terms of the source of inequality, what type of inequalities there are, the reason for, uh, for why there are the, there is inequality, and with respect to the cost of redistribution and the government's ability to redistribute. What, what I'm going to talk about today is, and which is the focus of our study, <clears throat> is uh, whether there also exist differences across the world in different countries in the willingness to accept inequality. So we know from previous work, and I'm sure quite a few of you are familiar with that, uh, from the World Value Survey, for example, <clears throat> that are big differences in people's beliefs about the source of inequality. Uh, that's not going to be the, 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 the main focus. We are going to do some work on that. We are collecting data on that as well. But the focus on, on in this presentation is going to be on people's fairness preferences. I'll explain what I mean by that. And in people's efficiency preferences. And we're going to study that both within countries and uh, we're going to look at across country variations. And then we will look at how these preferences, uh, fairness preferences and efficiency preferences, how those relate to policy attitudes. So just a disclaimer, so I don't disappoint people <laughs> immediately uh, or uh, quite soon, that uh, I'm going to, and in the, probably no surprise, I'm going to show you differences across countries and within countries. And one of the immediate questions you want to ask would be, <laughs> why do we have these differences? How can we understand uh, uh, why some countries um, have, uh, why, why some fairness views are more pre prevalent in some countries than in others? That's a super interesting question. Uh, we We'll try to use this data uh, in the future to shed some light on it, but essentially that's going to be beyond the scope of, of, of this, uh, uh, this presentation, despite the fact that I think this is a super interesting question, how, um, how uh, these preference preferences and co-evolve with social institutions. Okay, so what just... You might have noticed that I'm asking, in some sense, <laughs> a somewhat surprising question, namely, what, to what extent people accept inequality? And often we only talk about people's unwillingness to accept. So in, in this, in that sense, we are going to flip the question to some extent. Why would people want to accept inequality? Well, <clears throat> the classical argument for why we might want to accept inequality is the equality efficiency trade-off story, right? That, uh, well, if equality is good uh, from a welfare point of view, but there might be costs associated with trying to equalize income. If So there is a trade-off between equality and efficiency. So the, in other words, the main reason why you might want to accept inequality is that uh, you want to have a bigger pie, essentially. <laughs> But then there is also a, a fairness story, a fairness explanation for why you might want to explain, uh, why you might, why, why you might want to accept inequality. Um, and that would be this, the idea that certain types of inequalities are acceptable because they reflect things that we think people should be held responsible for. So those are kind of two very different stories. And to some extent, we're going to have a horse race between these two stories. What's what, what seems to be most important for people's willingness to accept inequality? Is it uh, efficiency or is it fairness? So for both these stories, both the classical story and the fairness story, both preferences and beliefs are going to be important. So the preferences, of, when you talk about the classical story, the trade-off between equality and efficiency is essentially how much weight you give <laughs> to uh, efficiency relative to uh, equality. And the preferences we're thinking about when you talk about um, uh, fairness preferences, it's essentially what type of inequalities do you consider fair? So your fairness views. <clears throat> Beliefs are also obviously important for both these stories. So if you 
um, in the efficiency equity equity trade-off story, your beliefs about the cost of redistribution uh, is going to be um, uh, very important. And for the fairness story, beliefs about the actual causes of, of inequality is going to be super important. And in this project, we're also going to look at we're going to look at both preferences and beliefs. I'm going to focus on the preference story since I only have 45 minutes, but I'm happy to take questions about uh, beliefs as well later on. OK, so just a quick roadmap for the next <laughs> um, 20 minutes. I'm going to describe the design. It's a pretty uh, involved and big uh, study. So I'm going to spend some time on that. And then I'm going to go to my main focus is going to be on the preference results. We're going to see a little bit, say a little bit about beliefs, and then policy attitudes and how those relates to preferences and beliefs. Before I wrap up, and then uh, so I'm not quite sure how this works. I'm not unable to look at the chat when I'm doing this full screen thing. So just interrupt me if there are questions or clarification or something like that. Okay, uh, thanks. Good. Perfect, thanks. Okay, so to the study design. So what do we do? So this Fairness Across the World study um, was implemented as a module in the Gallup World Poll in 2018. Uh, it's uh, sad to say we have still not really written up the paper. We are very close, but no, not yet. So Gallup World Poll, uh, for those of you who don't know it, is the gold standard of doing global um global story studies is run once a year it's really does at least the best possible job of getting uh, representative uh, samples in each countries um they we selected 60 countries um and we have uh, about 66000 participants at least 1000 in each country and in some of the bigger countries like china india and russia we have more people and our module consisted of three parts so the, the main part is what we call the, 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 the fairness prefer, uh, preference part. I'll explain this in detail. I'm just go, I'm going to give the overview. Uh, in that part, all respondents, all 66,000 respondents made a real distributive decision as a spectator. So they made a decision for two workers. So we actually had 66,000 pairs of workers involved in this as well. <clears throat> uh, then we had a module. Then we collected uh, beliefs. Um, all responded answered a subset of questions on their beliefs about the causes of inequality and their beliefs about the efficiency cost of redistribution. And then we had two questions uh, about attitudes to current inequality and whether the government should aim to reduce inequality. Uh, I should also say that, and what this is one of the benefits. Uh, it's crazy expensive to use this Gallup World Poll, but it's. Uh, very high quality data. Uh, and then on top of the data you uh, you get in your module, you also get access to a very broad set of background um, uh, background data. So they have approximately half an hour of background information and a lot of attitudes questions as well. So it's not only. We are not the first one to use the Gallup uh, World Poll. Uh, we were inspired by um, the work by Armin Falk and quarters and the global preference study that some of you uh, might know. Uh, our study differs from theirs in two respects, or in, in many, first of all, in the topic, of course, but also methodologically, uh, in that we are uh, in we are not doing a standard survey. We are actually having people make real distributive decisions, and we also um, uh, randomize people, the participants, into different treatments. Okay. Um, this is just a list of countries. Uh, we included most big countries, um, and um, uh, it covers all large economies and about 80% of the world uh, population. Here you see kind of the representativeness of the, of the study. Uh, we cover so the the pink countries are those included in the study and as you see apart from Africa where uh, there are a lot of countries in Africa <laughs> uh, we um, we uh, have um, 
covered a lot, and we have a very a fairly good distribution when it comes to both uh, income levels and inequality. Uh, so uh, I think in addition to having 60 countries, you also then have, I mean, a lot of different languages. So we translated our instructions, I think, to about 120 languages. So a lot of work. <laughs> um, so um, going in more detail on uh, the first part of this, and that's what I'm going to spend most time on uh, describing the fairness preference module, so to speak. So <laughs> we use a, what we call a spectator design. And what that means is that we have the participants are making real decisions between for other people who are not themselves recruited. They're independently recruited, so they are not recruited in the in the same way. We recruited them actually uh, to an online uh, labor market, MTurk. But uh, we, uh, but the, all the spectators, they decided how to distribute money between these two workers. So, uh, as I said, a representative sample of the, you know, the population. In most countries, this was done face to, to face. Uh, in I think in 42 other countries, uh, we did it face to face. And uh, I'm just moving something here so I can see better. Um, uh, yeah, and then we randomize people into three treatments, either the luck treatment, the merit treatment, or the efficiency treatment. And I'll first describe in detail just what people did in the luck treatment, and I'll explain what people in the merit and efficiency treatment did afterwards. So <clears throat> this is a, essentially a super simple uh, story. And I would say it's, I think it's something that is very easy to understand across cultures. So we tell people, and we tested it out. We did, I have to say, uh, we spent enormous amounts of time just traveling to different countries and testing out people's ability to understand this uh, setup. And essentially what we tell them is that uh, uh, some time ago, two people uh, were recruited to do some work. They got a fixed payment, but then at the end, after both of them having completed the task they were supposed to do, they were told by surprise, so this was not something they knew about, that one of them would get a bonus. So one of them would get a bonus. Uh, and in the luck treatment, we tell them that the bonus was determined by a random draw, so by pure luck. However, we also tell them that they were informed that one person would be informed about the outcome of this, <laughs> Uh, and given the opportunity to transfer money from the winner to the loser, or from the one receiving the $6 to, so it was $6 in the US. In all of the countries, we kind of adjusted the amounts uh, depending on the purchasing poverty in that country, and we used local currencies. <clears throat> so that's essentially uh, the story. And then we tell the participants, okay, and you are actually, <laughs> you are, uh, the person who, um, uh, this third party who's going to make the decision. And I have to say, sometimes people wonder to what extent people take this seriously. I mean, since they didn't really have any financial stake in the decision themselves, they were spectators of other people's money. Uh, having done all these <laughs> field uh, tests of this, I'm very convinced that people take this super seriously. Um, uh, they being uh, asked to make a decision to, that affects money for two other people uh, is something people seem to take very seriously. And of course, everyone who cares about fairness, they have incentive. They are incentivized on the utility margin. Okay, so that's that's essentially the the setup. We we had done we have done a, a slightly more um, in, a, in some sense a pilot study of this <laughs> uh, that. Uh, was published a couple of years ago in uh, JPE, where we did this in US and Norway. We had then people could choose a wider distribution of uh, uh, between more alternative distributions. Uh, here they chose either between leaving the distribution as, as it was, um, transferring one point five dollars, or transferring three dollars. 
Okay, so that's the that was the the, the luck treatment. Yeah, this is essentially what they could do. The alternatives they could leave it as is or redistribute. Uh, and of course, if they choose chose to transfer three dollars, that's equivalent to uh, equalizing the income. In the two other treatments, we manipulate two things. So I, yes, importantly, in the luck treatment, there is no cost to redistribution. So for each dollar a person transfer, uh, a dollar is received by uh, by the other by the person who didn't have anything. And we fix the source of the inequality to luck. Right. So that's what kind of that's the beauty of <laughs> I think of using experimental methods uh, when you do this type of work, right? So in the real world out there, uh, situations people might have different beliefs about the source of inequality, the cost of redistribution. We fix that. We fix the beliefs about the the cost of redistribution and the source of, in, uh, of in, uh, inequality. The merit treatment uh, was identical to the luck treatment. The only difference is that we this time told them that the person who received the six dollars was the most productive worker. We didn't, by the way, we didn't say anything about the type of task, what they were doing. We didn't say anything about how much better we just told this, told them that the most productive worker uh, got the money. Uh, the efficiency treatment <clears throat> is identical to the luck treatment in terms of the source of inequality. So we just a random draw that uh, that determined the who got the money. But this time we, there is a cost of redistribution. So actually, for each dollar transferred, one dollar is. Uh, last, so it's an iceberg cost. So if you want to equalize, you need to transfer four dollars, and you end up with two two. So this obviously is to highlight that the cost of uh, to transfer money. <clears throat> there could have been other ways of capturing this. <laughs> this is the simplest way we could uh, come up with. Okay, so that's the three treatments. Um, just so you know what type of framework we have in mind so essentially this i'm going to have this a very simple social preference model in uh, the back of my hand ahead when i interpret the results <clears throat> so the spectators they choose to the distribution right so with, if y is to share the income to the worker with no pre redistribution earnings we assume that the spectator you tell he cares about potentially at least about two things one is how the share of income going to <laughs> the the worker with no uh, pre redistribution earnings, uh, how close that is to what uh, the spectator considers fair. So he dislikes deviations from from uh, from what is seen as fair. So that's the first term in this utility function. This they dislike uh, deviating from fairness. The second term is that he also might dislike. Uh, uh, efficiency loss, if there is an efficiency loss. So uh, C is the cost of uh, redistribution, and then that's linked, obviously, as you see, to the, uh, the amount transferred. So notice here, what we're essentially saying is that people could can differ in two respects. They can differ in what they consider fair, and we assume that they might have three different fairness ideal, I come, uh, ideals, so we'll come back to them. Uh, and they might differ in how they tr trade off efficiency <laughs> versus uh, fairness. So that's that's essentially what you need to to uh, have in mind. Um, as I said, we assume that people can differ uh, in their fairness ideals. Just to simplify, I think in this super simple setting, the kind of three salient uh, fairness views. One is the egalitarian view. Essentially saying that inequalities due both to luck and to performance are unfair. Any inequalities are unfair, so you should always um, equalize, or the fair thing would always be to equalize. Then you have the meritocratic position that says, no, uh, okay, inequalities due to luck are unfair, but inequalities due to performance are fair. So you shouldn't do anything about that. And then you have the libertarian position saying that inequalities both due to luck and performance are unfair. 
okay so that's uh essentially the <laughs> what i wanted to say uh about uh the 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 fairness uh design quickly about beliefs <laughs> we also asked believe um, all part participants about a subset um of questions uh, about uh, what they believed was the reason why rich people and why people the rich people in their country were rich and why they were um, or richer than the poor. So questions of the type, in your country, one of the main reasons for the rich being richer than the poor is that the rich have had more luck in life, worked harder in life, had greater inability, uh, innate abilities than the, than the poor, and so forth. We actually had a pretty long list to be asked also about um, uh, that they're being criminal, more selfish, being more patient, more willing to take risks, and so forth. Today I'm going to focus on essentially luck and merit part of this. So um, uh, I mainly report on the beliefs in luck and hard work. And then we had a question about the cost of redistribution uh, in your country. If the government increases the taxes that the rich have to pay, the rich will work less and invest less. This is clearly only capturing one aspect, but uh, this is the cost of redistribution question that we found worked best. And then finally, we had two questions uh, about um, policy attitudes. Everyone were asked uh, two questions on a uh, one to, yeah, so that we used a one to five disagree, agree scale earlier as well. So um, they had to, um, uh, they were asked about their agreement with the statement in your country, the economic differences between the rich and the poor are unfair. And uh, the statement in your country, the national government should aim to redistribute the economic differences, reduce, I'm sorry, <laughs> aim to reduce the economic differences between the rich and the poor. Okay, that was uh, what I wanted to say about the design. Um, if there are burning questions, I'll happy to take them now uh, about the design. Otherwise, I'll proceed to the, to the uh, results. I don't see okay. any questions yet in the chat. So yeah, maybe we can keep going. Yeah, perfect, perfect. And I'm happy to take them afterwards, of course. Great. So preferences. Okay, so what I'm gonna show you now, uh, it's a map that's gonna resemble the first map I showed you in, in the sense that it's gonna be a map reporting Gini coefficient, the average Gini coefficient in different countries. So for, for, for each decision that a spectator uh, took, uh, each aspect to the made, we can calculate the uh, post redistribution inequality <laughs> in the in the pair that they uh, made a decision for. Right. So if they didn't if they didn't redistribute at all, that the Gini coefficient in their pair would be one. If they equalized, it would be zero. Right. And it would be obviously in between if they chose to uh, do something in between. So uh, for each country, we take the average, uh, implement the Gini, and uh, uh, and also the first slide I'm going to show you now, it's going to be across all treatments. Then we're going to kind of uh, unpack it. So just keep in mind before I show you the results <laughs> that if there are no differences, systematic differences in fairness use, uh, or in the efficiency equity trade-off across countries. Even if there are a lot of variations, you know there are a lot of dis disagreements within countries, but if there are no systematic differences across countries, since people are making um, decisions in identical situations here across countries, differences in the implemented Gini must reflect differences in their preferences either in their fairness preferences or in their uh, um, efficiency preferences. Okay, so here's the result. <clears throat> okay, so let this uh, sink in. Uh, I think this is, uh, I'm always smiling when I look at this uh, map. Um, so what you see here obviously is uh, enormous differences in, in, in uh, inequality acceptance. So, 
in a country like China, the, G, the implemented Gini coefficient is something like 0.75 across the different treatments, or even more. And then you have a country like Norway <laughs> where they implemented uh, um, uh, uh, Gini is about 0.3 or something. So you see, in identical situations, there are enormous differences across societies in their willingness to accept um, inequality in identical situations. Okay, so that's, uh, in some sense, this is <laughs> one of the main results, uh, but let's start to unpack this. So first, just looking at the global level. So before we start looking into the differences between uh, between uh, countries, let's look at the um, at the global level. And so let's start with the upper left panel. So that essentially shows the average implemented inequality uh, across the three treatments. Um, what we see here is that in the luck treatment, the average implemented inequality, um, so the, the mean Gini across the world, <laughs> is about 0. 0.42. <clears throat> okay, so what is the, and then we can ask the question, what is the effect of just manipulating the source of inequality, going from luck to merit? And you see there is an enormous effect, right? Um, it's about almost 0. 0.3. Uh, going, so we go from 0. 0.42 to about 0. 0.70. So people really care. People are much, uh, globally, people care about the source of inequality uh, a lot. And then you can compare that. You see that if you move from the luck treatment to the efficiency treatment, where the only difference is that you increase the cost of redistribution. So for each dollar you transfer, a dollar is lost. You see that that has an effect. And of course, we have a very large sample, so it's super significant. <laughs> But it's much, much, much smaller uh, than the effect of manipulating the source of inequality. Okay, so what we can do now is also look at how these things vary uh, across uh, different subgroups. So we can look at how it varies by uh, gender, by education, by income. What I first just wanted to show you here is that to, to show you that the main patterns are very similar. The main patterns are very similar. So in all subgroups, people <laughs> uh, find inequalities due to merit much more acceptable than inequalities due to luck. And they care about efficiency. It goes for male versus females, low and high educated people, uh, low and high income uh, people. By the way, when we classify people as having low or high income, it's relative to, to their... Um, to their national population. So <clears throat> but what we can look at, uh, and I think this is, I just highlighted one of a lot of <laughs> results we have here, um, but that is the, the difference in the treatment effect. And I'm going to focus on mainly on the, on the merit effect since that's where we have the strong results. So uh, what I'm showing you here is uh, the difference in how much uh, it matters for the respondents, whether or not the source of inequality is luck or merit. And what you see from this figure is that people with high income care much more about the source of inequality than people with low income. So they are, in that sense, more meritocratic. So. I forgot to say that, but if you take our fairness views, the egalitarians and the libertarians, they don't care about the source of inequality because the egalitarians, they say, I want to equalize anyhow. Uh, and the libertarians say, I'm going <laughs> to, I'm not going to do anything anyhow. So meritocrat and meritocrats are people who care about the source of inequality. And what we see is that people with high income, people with high education, and to some extent, males are more meritocratic. They care more about uh, the uh, source of um, uh, inequality <clears throat> than low income, low education, and females at the global level. 
Okay, so then jumping into uh, the country differences, and I'm sorry for the <laughs> for all this data on the on the same slide. Uh, <clears throat> start just looking at um, the left uh, panel. So what we show in the left panel is the implemented genie in the different countries in the study ranked, and <clears throat> I think this is. This is just crazy striking <laughs> in many ways. So what? So one, the easiest way you, know, you can almost translate this into the share of people who accept the inequality as it is. So the the share the genie is more is quite close to corresponds very well to the share of people in the country who just leave the inequality as it is. And if you look at Norway, for example, the Gini coefficient. <laughs> is point, uh, point, uh, just about point 0.1. That means that uh, actually in Norway, less than 10% are willing to leave the in accept the inequality as it is when the source of inequality is low. And then compare that with, for example, China and, and, uh, and India, where the Gini, average Gini is above 0.7 which means that 70, uh, almost 70 percent are willing to <laughs> accept the inequality as it is. So enormous differences across the world uh, in the willingness to accept um, uh, inequalities due to luck. <clears throat> so by the way, uh, two of the countries that we did this with, or we had done the study in uh, for for Norway and the US before, and then we so we replicate the the the, the results we had uh, in 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 that paper. It's also interesting. I'll just as a side I notice that we, um, for Norway and US, we also collected uh, in the previous study we collected data on political affiliation, and then we could compare the within country difference in inequality acceptance due to uh, to luck. Uh, between right wingers and left wingers, so Democrats, Republicans in the U.S. and yeah, so much different in uh, in in Norway. And there is a a significant, a fairly large difference, but it's kind of like 0.1 Gini. So you see, the country differences are much much larger than what you would you see between uh, socioeconomic groups in a country and also between uh, people with different political affiliations within the same country. Okay, so in panel B, we see that the difference in between um, uh, when it comes to acceptance of inequality to merit is much smaller. It's, so you shift up uh, the, uh, the inequality acceptance, in particular in the countries that had low inequality acceptance and luck. And then you see that it's quite similar, uh, the acceptance uh, um, uh, in panel C, for efficiency as in luck. Okay, here is maybe something uh, more, um, yeah, I, I think, uh, even more striking, namely the difference in the, the treatment effect. So what I'm reporting in panel, in the left panel here, is the difference between, for each country, the difference in the inequality of seconds due to, in situations where the inequality is due to luck, and merit. So, uh, if if uh, so, the first the first countries we uh, on the top, India, China, essentially they don't distinguish based on the source of inequality. And then you see at the other end, uh, countries like uh, Canada, Australia, Norway, Netherlands, Portugal. The source of inequality matters enormously, <laughs> and I think this is this difference is 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 striking, right? Because often we have a tendency uh, to generalize based on uh, studies done in Western uh, countries, and in all the Western countries, you see this uh, huge importance of the source of inequality, but that is not uh, necessarily a global phenomenon. And then you also see uh, some variation, but not as large in terms of the treat, how much pe the people in different countries care about efficiency. Okay, 
let's continue. So based on these data, uh, we can also classify uh, countries and the prevalence of different fairness types um, uh, in different uh, countries. Essentially, this gives very much the same picture as we saw earlier. Uh, you see that typical Western uh, countries, United States, uh, Switzerland, uh, Netherlands, Canada, Norway, Australia. What is really characterizing these countries, even though they might differ in terms of <laughs> how much libertarian and how much egalitarian they are, it is the fact that they are meritocrats. They really, there is a large fraction of, of people who um, are who equalize uh, for inequalities due to luck, but don't equalize for inequalities uh, that reflect uh, differences in performance. But that's the the the, um, the striking picture. Okay, we can now <coughs> try to shed more light on kind of what what correlates uh, um, between uh, the country differences. Uh, then on this slide, we report uh, how um, how inequality acceptance relate to the GDP uh, per capita in countries. And actually, just the, the first, uh, the upper two panels, they just show the relationship between income level and average across all treatments um uh, uh inequality acceptance so the left one uh upper left shows this relationship in our experiments and, and what, what you see is that the, the richer countries are less inequality accepting on average uh, and this is actually also what you see when you look at the actual inequality in country uh, in different countries and gdp the the richer countries are on average less unequal but I think the most striking uh, pattern here is what we see in panel C, namely that there is a very strong relationship between <clears throat> the treatment effect of merit, so the, the, how much more inequality you're willing to accept uh, in the merit treatment rather than in the luck treatment, and the income level. So essentially what we, we see here is that richer countries are meritocratic. Uh, there is a fascinating story there in some sense, I think, uh, trying to figure out how that, in what direction that relationship goes. Is it the fact that you become richer from being meritocratic or uh, um, the other way around? Possibly both. And then we don't see a strong relationship between income levels and uh, the importance attached to efficiency. And then <laughs> something you might have wondered about already, uh, to what extent is it the case that uh, countries that are very unequal um, also accept more inequality in the experiment? And yes, the, that's what we find. Of course, we only have 60 countries, but you see a pretty big jump, especially in the, the luck and efficiency um, treatments. We see that the in, in implemented genie is much uh, is increasing with the uh, uh, actual genie in in the countries. Okay, um, then quickly, I'll just make sure now that I don't go. Uh, so, how much? When should I stop the uh, actual presentation and go to questions? Is that in five minutes or ten minutes? Uh, in ten minutes. And ten already, minutes. if you yeah. want to take a question already, Alexander, there was a question on one of the recent slides. Okay, just yeah, shoot. So, then we break um, up a bit. Yeah. Yeah, this is a question from Diego, and it was referring to the slide on income and inequality acceptance. Yeah. And the question is, in the previous graphs, the classification did not add up to one for all countries. Is there a fourth classification or unclassified? There is. A, yeah, there is. Uh, so essentially, uh, if you um, if you give um, more to yeah so 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 it is possible it's it's a very small fraction of people but essentially if you don't give everything to uh, to someone in the married treatment uh, for example that would be um that then you would be uh, classified as so essentially if people are choosing intermediate the decisions can be unclassified that's the sh the short story but it's it's a fairly small group okay thanks Great. alexander but yeah please go ahead you yeah. have another 10 minutes yeah okay Perfect. Then I'll have time to do this carefully. Uh, 
Okay, so we had a lot of questions. We actually have a small paper also already out in PNS on uh, the importance of essentially beliefs about to, to what extent people who are selfish and criminal <laughs> are they is that the reason why people are rich and they believe in that uh, uh, what I want to focus on now is essentially belief in to what extent inequality is actually a result of luck uh, or if it reflects merit um, and this is the response to the question of luck uh, it doesn't say that so this is on, on a one to um one to five scale it essentially means that most people globally believe and this is uh, in the global sample believe that uh, luck is an important source what i really wanted to show you is this that essentially people globally believe that luck is more important in determining uh people's um uh determining whether you're rich or poor than merit I mean, as a merit, we uh, I think this is referring to hard work. You could also look at it both as hard work and uh, talent, innate abilities. It doesn't really matter. It's a robust to two definitions of, uh, of merit. Uh, actually, of all the, I think we had seven, nine, eight or nine uh, different potential sources of inequality. What people believe globally is the least important is actually hard work. Globally, that's what people think is least important in determining why the rich are rich. <laughs> uh, what people actually believe is the most important uh, is maybe not surprising, family background. So, and I have to say, having done these pilots and uh, done pilots in, yeah, for example, sitting with farmers in Ethiopia uh, who have definitely worked very hard their whole entire life, I'm not that surprised that they don't believe that hard work is what explains why the rich are rich. Okay, uh, what I just want to show you one more figure in terms of um, uh, beliefs, and that is essentially the relative importance of um, merit versus luck across countries. And what you see here essentially is that <laughs> there's a huge difference in how important uh, people in different countries believe that believe that luck is relative to 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 merit. And some of these things we have seen before. We see, for example, that um, in a country like uh, Norway and Scandinavia that I'm from, people tend to believe that uh, luck is much less um, uh, luck is much more important than merit. Uh, Americans believe uh, much more, for example, in um, in merit, but um, that belief is even stronger uh, in China, uh, for example, uh, where they believe that um, uh, merit is actually more important than um, than, um, than uh, where merit is more important than than, um, than luck. Okay, so starting to wrap up, going towards the policy attitude. So we, as I said, we had. Uh, two questions. One is to what extent you believe that you you think that that the inequality in your society is unfair. Uh, uh, <clears throat> this question, those inequality, uh, and what we want to to study now is to what extent the behavior we see in the experiment, your willingness to accept inequality in the experiment, does that predict whether people consider inequality in their own country to be unfair. So that's the exercise we want to do. And essentially, this, the answer is, is yes. So, um, and in, in particular, your willingness to accept inequality uh, in the luck and efficiency treatments is very strongly correlated with, um, with um, uh, the view uh, that um, inequality in your society is unfair. So people who implement a lot of inequality in the experiment, they are less likely to say that inequality in their own country is unfair. And we see also, not maybe not surprisingly, that the belief in luck, if you believe that luck, um, belief in merit, if you believe that merit is very important, you are equally less likely to say that you think uh, inequality is unfair, you're more likely to say it if you believe that luck is important. 
And the importance of uh, behavior in the experiment and the actual uh, implemented Gini is more or less unaffected by using controls uh, for these beliefs in merit and in love. Okay. So uh, finally, uh, policy support <laughs> is the question we want to ask here is to what extent support for redistrib um, redistribution uh, is determined by whether people find inequality in their society to be unfair. So this is kind of going back to the two stories we had, right? Two reasons why people <laughs> might be um, um, against redistribution. One is that they find um, the inequality fair, or, or if they find it unfair, they would support redistribution. Um, an alternative uh, story could be related to uh, the cost of redistribution. So people who believe it's very costly uh, would be uh, against redistribution. People who think it's less costly should be more in favor. There are obviously a lot of other factors like selfishness, trust in the government and so forth. And we have some of uh, some uh, data that can help us control for that as well. But here is the main results. <clears throat> so what we, uh, the dependent variable here is um, the participants' response to the question that uh, agreement with a statement, national government should aim to reduce economic differences between rich and poor. And what you see here is that <coughs> your response to the fairness question, that if you agree that inequalities in your society is unfair, you're much more likely <laughs> to, to uh, also uh, support government redistribution. Uh, Belief in cost also matters, uh, but it matters less than um, inequality um, uh, fairness use. And we see that everything of this holds if you controlled for the participants' answer to questions about their confidence in national government. It's a zero one question, and to their uh, whether or not they're high income or low income. Okay. So then I'm ready to wrap up and hopefully more or less on time. Um, so what we have tried to show you um, essentially is that the fairness story seems to be more important than the efficiency story for inequality acceptance. Uh, the source of inequality uh, is important for inequality acceptance in almost all countries, not all, as, as you, I told you. Uh, in uh, China and India, for example, much less so, but the cost of redistribution is of much less importance in most countries. Uh, and fairness considerations are also strongly predictive for uh, policy support. Efficiency considerations, not so much. Uh, <clears throat> and we also then find that fairness preferences, you at the belief in whether or not the inequality in your society is fair or not, are important for explaining the extent to which people find in Yeah, fair, no, I'm sorry, fairness preferences are, and they're implemented in inequality and experiment, are important for explaining the extent to which people find inequality in their society to be unfair. And then finally, <clears throat> taking the global perspective, <coughs> uh, people are um, yeah, in unequal countries, we find that people are more inequality accepting <laughs> so, uh, than uh, people in more equal countries, but they're not more efficiency seeking. So that, and then comparing rich and poor countries, we find that people are more meritocratic in their, in, um, in the fairness use in rich countries, but they're not more efficiency seeking. And this is actually very mapping very nicely with the pattern we find within countries that high income and highly educated people are more meritocratic within countries, but they're not more efficiency seeking. And then as I announced <laughs> early, uh, future work, and I think it's gonna be super important to try to study the causal pathways explaining the global variations in uh, that we have uncovered in these um, fairness preferences. And by the way, we will make all these data available uh, as soon as we just managed to, <laughs> to submit our work um, to publish our own uh, paper on this. And uh, I, uh, 
hope that uh, people will um, use that data set. I think it's a lot of cool stuff there. So thank you. Should I stop sharing now? Uh, sure, if you'd like. Yeah. And actually, if you want to keep it up, Alexander, um, yeah. there may be some questions uh, specific to your slides. But thank you okay. so much for such a compelling talk. And we can now go into our Q&A session that we'll have for the next 15 minutes or so, depending on questions. I see a couple of questions in the chat, but I just want to say to the audience, feel free to raise your hand as well. Um, and while you guys put in more questions or raise your hand, we can start with one of the questions in the chat. Um, there's a question from Mustafa. And the question is, as you know, too large a sample may amplify the detection of differences, emphasizing statistical differences. So did you calculate effect size as well, which is independent from sample size? Yeah, so we, we do. Uh, yeah, yeah, of course, we uh, estimate the effect size. And when it comes to, um, and I guess you can see that right from, especially when you compare, uh, so, um, when we measure the uh, effect size of the, the treatment effects, right? That That is the effect size. I guess that's what we're talking about. And uh, I mean, everything we do more or less when you do it at the individual level is we get significance, obviously, right? So there's not an issue of statistical significance because we get that for very small effect sizes. So these are substantial differences. Uh, and as I said, the implemented genie, for example, when you compare at the global level, when you compare uh, the lock treatment and the merit treatment, is is huge, right? So you're going from a genie for 0.4 to 0.7. Okay, great. I see a, a hand raised by Christina. So Christina, please feel free to go ahead. And you're just muted right now. Thank you, Alexander. Fantastic work. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Great to see I you, just, Christina. <laughs> I just sent you two papers. Uh, that oh, thank you. <laughs> and uh, I'm very curious. Uh, you know, what we did uh, in America, you know, because yeah. it was just uh, in the US, uh, is uh, looking at uh, uh, autonomy, okay, how people, how much people perceive themselves and other people as autonomous and how it affects uh, their perception of inequality. And the more autonomous people are, and they perceive other people as autonomous, the less inequality they think there exists. Ah. And the more uh, they, uh, you know, basically they think uh, merit is responsible and merit could be talent or it could be hard effort. And very autonomous people think hard effort is really important, mm -hmm. okay? What I find very interesting here, um, and you know, uh, we didn't study that, uh, is whether greater autonomy is linked to income and education. Mm -hmm. Because uh, uh, in this case, uh, you know, you do this experiment, uh, you know, how much should be redistribute, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, uh, my interest was uh, how do they perceive inequality? How much inequality there is? And of course, if you perceive there is little inequality uh, and the world is fair, which is crazy, but uh, very autonomous <laughs> people in the US have this perception. Of course, uh, the policy implication is huge. Okay, but uh, uh, my question is, uh, uh, is it possible that, at least in the US, and we didn't calculate that, that autonomy is much linked with income and education? And in this case, higher income, higher education, higher autonomy, a perception of inequality would become really low. They won't think there is so much poverty, inequality, et cetera, et cetera. This is uh, this is my question. I'm very interested in that. I work with psychologists, etc. We measure this stuff. No, thank you, Christina. This, these are great questions, and I have to admit we haven't looked at it. I think what we could clearly do, and so what we have done, of course, is to estimate, for example, the socioeconomic gradients, right, uh, in the treatment effects in different countries, and you so you could look at so what you would expect predict, right, if you have. Uh, in in a country like US, if I understood you correctly, is that it would be a stronger um, 
uh, association between income and education and the treatment effect, right? So that uh, in the in the US, then it would be uh, in some other countries. And that is something we could test clearly. So that would be interesting. Unfortunately, we don't have we don't have individual level measures of of autonomy directly, right? So we, we um, yeah, but, that you uh, find them yeah. in the article I send you, basically. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Uh, <laughs> we use Daichi and Company. These are really standard measure of autonomy. The interest, the second interesting thing is in the US, typically, people who have high autonomy believes other people have. Okay, yeah. believe that everybody basically is a master of her own destiny or whatever. Yeah. Uh, if uh, instead, uh, I think in Italy or in Europe, you know, people may have a high perception of autonomy, but not necessarily generalized autonomy, in which yeah. case uh, um, there would be very different results. Yeah. And very but, curious about that. Yeah, uh, and, uh, but what really strikes me, I mean, I would have expected maybe initially that the U.S. would be an outlier when it came to, for example, the uh, the difference in the relative importance of merit relative to luck. Yes. But what do you see? Uh, and this is, of course, based on all these data, right? Comparing you, you, Europe and U.S., and then you find that you, the Americans are much much stronger believers in um, yes. in people. Um, uh, being responsible for their yes. own uh, income level, right? But then when you look at the global data, you see that uh, U.S. is just in the middle there. You have Asian countries where that ID is much stronger. And I think that it's really, I mean, almost crazy, right? Is that when you estimate the share of libertarians, people who just accept any type of inequality, that share is much larger in in. in in some uh, big uh, Asian countries, for example. Well, in China. China and India. <laughs> India so, uh, too. That's India very too. interesting. Very and, I think, and we also have studied, so we have a PhD student who worked with us to look at, for example, the correlation with religion. And there is a strong, and I think this is kind of fascinating, just showing essentially how much we could potentially get out of these type of data, right? So in... Uh, so when you take, and this goes to the whole concept of luck and a random draw, right? So in, uh, in we have a, in the, our, our part of the world, our Western part of the world, we have a pretty clear idea what a random draw is, right? And it's random. It's no, no, there isn't, there's not destiny to that, right? But in a lot of other cultures, it's not really random, right? And if you're strict, strong, a strongly religious person, I mean, what happens to you randomly might reflect something else, <laughs> someone's wealth. And that's what you see, that people who are self-proclaimed uh, religious or say that re religion and say that religion is important in their life, they're more willing to accept inequality due to luck. And you see in particular a huge effect in India for the Hindu effect, essentially. Uh, would, uh, would it be the same in a Protestant country? Uh, so we have we, we, we see the same uh, pattern that people who are in a Protestant country, that people pick country, that people who say that they're very religious, they're also more willing to accept inequality due to law. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so totally fascinating. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Alexander and, and Christina, for those questions. Alexander, uh, there was another question in the chat which you have you know, touched upon, I don't know if you want to add more on this, but Cornelia wrote um, that this talk was fascinating. Did you look at the implications of religion is the question. I don't know if you have anything <laughs> exactly. more to add. Yeah, but you pretty much covered that just now, but feel free to add any more if you'd like. Yeah, I mean, maybe just go, because this is something that often comes up, right? So, and I think this is one of the bigger puzzles. And I, and I also think it's important to qualify. So when we do our classification, we say that if you accept inequalities, both due to luck, and due to uh, to merit, you're a libertarian, and that's of course associated with this philosoph philosophical position, right? <laughs> that uh, you you might know. But of course, if we have a purely behavioral measure of this, so it could be, so we it could be that people in China, uh, for example, are more reluctant to change <laughs> the. The, the 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 initial distribution just for for any reason right so they will behaviorally be, be uh libertarians in our in our framework but in some sense it's 
doesn't necessarily need to reflect the kind of philosophical view <laughs> that we uh, associate with um, libertarianism. Okay. Just adding on that, it could, for example, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Great. Great, thank you, Alexander, and Cornelia for that question. We have another question from Sammy, um, and Sammy writes, I wonder what are your thoughts, why Egypt scores very closely to Norway and other West European countries across all treatments in the preferences section? And of course, contrasts hugely from South Africa and Algeria. No, that, that is, and I have to apologize. We have not yet managed to kind of look into kind of these more country specific stories. Mm -hmm. So, but I would love if somebody, I, I guess this, these slides, anyone can, can get them. If people have ideas about that, I would love to get them. Uh, I don't have the, the country uh, knowledge to really answer that, but, but you see some, so, uh, some patterns like that and I think it's just fascinating and there must be a story behind it because we, we are powered right to really identify country differences so it's um, it's not kind of it's not nice right there is something there but uh, I'm not I don't know uh, enough about the countries to, to to really say that okay okay gotcha and also in the chat Christina has shared the two different recent papers that she was referring to earlier as well um, yeah. we've covered <laughs> At this stage, we've covered the questions in the chat, but feel free if anyone wants to raise their hand or ask anything else um, for both Alexander and Adu. Uh, but if not, I think it might be an appropriate time to start wrapping up. Um, so what I can do is I can share one last slide. Unless, Christina, was there anything else from your end? All good? No, no. I'm okay. Happy. okay. <laughs> Great. So what I'll do is I'll just share one last screen for a moment. Just one second. And just to wrap up today's session, well, first of all, before we go into the next talk that we'll have, just wanted to extend and express deep appreciation both to Alexander and Adu for your very compelling talks today. And um, just seeing a lot of engagement and participation from participants, we see that is really quite fascinating. Um, for those interested in looking again at the slides or sharing this talk, this will be posted on YouTube, um, the recording of this. And, uh, and yeah, just in terms of uh, the way forward, we look forward to uh, everyone's participation in the next Nobeck talk, which will be by Dr. Gretchen Chapman from Carnegie Mellon University. And this talk will take place in the new year on Thursday, January 25th at 1 p.m. EST. So today's session is the last talk that we have for this year. And, uh, and as we mentioned before, we have a full lineup for 2024. We thank you all so much uh, for your participation today and also just throughout the year. And we look forward to seeing you next time. So thank you all so much and wishing you all happy holidays in the meantime.